we are in a series called Sermon on the Mount, and what we're doing is we're going through Jesus' teaching, and Jesus, it's funny, his reputation in the media is completely different than what he really is. I mean, the way that Jesus is depicted in the media, he's just this, this milk toast type of guy that's really thin, uh, walks around with high cheekbones, and just walks around in a British accent, and, and just goes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And he just walks around kind of weird. And I guarantee you, if that's how Jesus was, he would have never been placed on the cross. He would have never had any impact. If anything, Jesus was extremely controversial, especially to the religious people of his day. And, 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 and he said things that were incredible, but he did not say things to hurt people. He said things to heal people. And we're here not to say things to hurt people. We're here to bring things to heal people because Jesus is in the healing and restoration business. That's why he's here. If you're alive here today, there is a reason you're here. We believe that Jesus has a personal plan for each and every one of you, and you matter to God. And he's for you, and he's not against you. just want to let you know that. And so I just want to share a story with you for a few moments as I fix my microphone. That's choking me. Hang on a second. There we go. Um, in Kentucky, a number of years ago, there was uh, Frank and Elizabeth Morris had a son who was killed in an automobile accident. A drunk driver struck him. 26-year-old killed an 18-year-old and struck him. And they were absolutely, absolutely devastated. And, and what happened was this. Uh, the woman was, uh, they went to every single trial. They wanted to make sure he got what he deserved. Now, let's be honest. If someone were to, if my son were to, God forbid, die in an automobile accident, it was because of the hands of a drunk driver, you better believe that I, I, I don't even know how I would handle that. But they kept making sure he got justice. It was 10 years. Then he got off of good behavior. And so they would go to the court hearings to make sure they let their presence be known. So anyhow, the, the guy gets out and he's got to come on a weekend. It's kind of a weird thing, but one of his, one of his purposes is that he has to go and speak at MAD, Mothers Against Drinking and Driving, and that's what he did. And he was going to those meetings and, uh, and Elizabeth Morris would go and, and what happened was she would listen to him and, and she was sort of moved by it. I and mean, she went backstage to, to try to, she's a, a person of faith. She went backstage to talk to him and she smelt liquor on his breath. She said, what kind of guy are you? What kind of guy are you? In fact, I quote, I quote where she said, we wanted him in prison. We wanted him dead. This guy, Tommy, what he did. But there was one little problem. It was eating her up. And so what she decided to do, she decided to lay, her and her husband laid it down before the Lord, said, Lord, you've forgiven us. And she began to visit this guy. And she went to his apartment and she said, I can see you have alcohol in your breath. I'm here to help you. And God did a miracle in this man's life. The next thing you know, he started going to church with them. They started reading the Bible together. And, and, and another thing that was, it was crazy is they adopted him as their son. She goes, I, my son was murdered. That's true. But, I have, but God's grace has brought new life. And this man who was once, he was tortured. He was tortured. He was drinking himself to, he, you know, he was still tortured by it. He was forgiven and he found the greatest grace and that's Jesus Christ. Think about it. She lost, her and her, and her husband lost their only son. Do you realize that God lost his only son unjustly on the cross by a people called you and me? And do you realize what the pain that that was? You see, the reason I bring this up for is because we think murder is the ultimate sin, right? Obviously, taking someone else's life. But what's even more amazing is God's great mercy and grace that he wants to restore, that he will make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. And, and so I'm here to tell you, we're, we're not about condemnation here. We're about God's healing. God wants to restore you. God loves you. 
And, and, and the topic I'm going to bring up today, I recognize it's going to hit a lot of buttons in people's lives. And I, I want to share with you the words of Christ. And I want to let you know that there's new beginnings and new days. Please understand that. God is for you. He's not against you. But he loves you. And I, I want to share with you uh, what that simply means. That actually, a lot of people would say that 85% of the culture today, anyone you talk to, has been directly or indirectly affected by divorce. And, and it's been very, very painful for many people. And when I even say the word, floods of emotions come. And maybe you're, you're not, your, Olympic system, your Olympic system and your brain is going off. You can't even think anymore because I've said something. Would you please just realize that God is for you, not against you. He's not against you. Amen. And so what happens next? And so this is what I want to encourage you. For God did not send his son into the world. We, we talk about this, to condemn the world. If he were to come to condemn, we'd all be dead already. And that'd be the end of it, Right? He did not come to condemn the world, but that the world would be might, but the world through him, through him, might be saved. God wants to save us. So, so. He wants to restore us, and, and, and that's the Greek word for safe. He wants to bring us to reconciliation. He wants to bring us to health. He wants to bring you to new life. Please understand, that's why Jesus came. The enemy came to use the scripture to condemn you. We're not here to condemn anybody. I want to make that perfectly clear. All right? Now, God is about saving us. I want to get that abundantly clear. And that's what I hear. Whatever your past is, whatever you've been through, God wants to save you. And I want to share with you a, a, a story. Uh, we've shared a story before, but it's such a profound story. I want to bring it up again. Uh, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to get him trapped. And so then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. I think most of us know the story, but I'll go ahead and read it. And when they had set her in the midst, well, how, first of all, how'd they catch her in the first place? You see, they were using the woman to get what they wanted. They were prostituting her to get at Jesus. Think about it. They were taking advantage of a woman and what she was doing. And where's the man, by the way? So the scholars and the Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in an adultery, in the very act of adultery. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. See, they, they understand that the Jewish people under Roman authority don't have the right to do that. And so they're trying to get Jesus to say something, trap him in his words. Either he comes down too hard. If he doesn't say that, then, well, he's against the law of Moses. So he'll, he'll upset the conservative church. If he lets him off the hook, they're just trying to get him trapped. Okay? But what do you say? And so let me just say, if someone's trying to trap you, sometimes the best thing to do is say nothing. And just ask them a question back. Okay? This, they say, testing him, that they might have something which to accuse him of. That's what the enemy do. The enemy of our life takes the scripture to cut you and dice you. That's what he wants to do. But Jesus stooped down. I mean, just talking, he just stoops down. He begins to write on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Just ignore it. What do you say, Jesus? That's why you're just sitting there doing that, right? So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. You see, in the law back at that day, if you were going to accuse somebody of something, it was your responsibility to pick up the stone and throw it first. So what was he writing on the ground? I think it's quite obvious from the context. He probably was writing about the stuff they were doing. Putting the women's names down. I don't know. So that's what he says. And again, he stooped down. He said that. He stoops down again and sits there writing these things in the ground and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest and to the last. I, I, I've noticed the older I get, and I, I, being the second anniversary of my 27th birthday, uh, let's just say when I was 23, I had all the answers and I could tell everyone what to do. 
When I was an assistant pastor, I knew exactly what the 65-year-old pastor should be doing, and if I was in charge, things would be going a whole lot better. I had the answer to a lot of stuff. That's all I'm wanting to say. And so, and who are the smart ones? The guys that are older, like, you know, the older ones left first. That's what happened, right? And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, notice he didn't answer the question. He just said, he is without sin, cast the first stone. He didn't answer their question. He said a statement, and then he wrote stuff on the ground. When Jesus raised himself, he's down the whole time. Here's the woman. And he saw the woman, uh, he raised himself up and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I. Go ahead and live the way you want to live, but don't hurt anybody. It's okay. We've changed as a culture. We've adapted. It's only a physical action. It has no, it has no retribution on anybody. If you're hungry, you eat. If you're thirsty, you drink. If you want sex, you have sex. It's okay. And after all, we cannot control ourselves. If, if we stop doing that, Jesus said, then you're going to hurt yourself psychologically and you have to go for counseling. <laughs> so therefore, you have to give in to your passions. Is that what Jesus said? No. That's what I hear today. That's what I hear today. What do he say? Neither do I condemn you. People like that part. And then what does he say? Go and sin no more. Sin means no more missing the mark in this area. Stop going around with different people. She was given she was given forgiveness. Now, why do I bring this up for? Why do I bring up a certain person that killed a person's son and this? Because I want to show you God's heart. God's heart is about your restoration. God's not about damning anybody. He's here to save you. He's here to heal you. And the enemy would take the church and utilize it to hurt people and make it seem like we're monsters. It isn't about that. Jesus is about restoring what is lost. And I recognize here today that there are people that grew up, 80% of you, as I mentioned earlier, are been uh, affected by divorce of of one kind or another. And maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you're on your second marriage. Maybe the person you're living with right now is not even your spouse because you tried that, did that, and it's only a piece of paper after all, so God's gonna understand that. We love God, we love each other, we're married in God's eyes, but we don't want a piece of paper. And so maybe that's you right now, and, and you're feeling like, oh great, he's gonna talk about this. I have news for you that God loves you whatever state you're in, but he loves you too much to allow you to hurt yourself and to hurt society about and around you. And so before your emotions run into your head and you feel like he's going to talk about me being a bad person and I'm not good. No, we're not about that. We're about restoration. Why are we about restoration? Because I am a sinner and so are you. I'm saved by grace. Amen. We all need Jesus. He's come to say that which is lost. I'm a saint with a sin problem. A big one. Ask my wife. <laughs> now, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in... By the way, this is the next verse over that. Never he says to me, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then he goes on to say, the next verse, there's a reason why John put this next verse in there. He says, come follow, you know, do not sin anymore. Then he says this. He spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. So if you're gonna follow Jesus, you don't need to be walking in darkness anymore. That's what he's talking about. I am the light of life. Now, God is about saving us. I hope you understand that. He's about healing you and healing me. The word of God is our standard. I need to go back here again because a lot of people give their opinions. If people ask me opinions about, I don't wanna give my opinion. I just don't. I wanna say what the word of God says, not my opinion. When Jesus was tempted, guess what he said? Well, Satan, I think, uh, no, he said, it is written. It is written. And so when society comes to us, people ask me, what is the Bible? I said, I don't have an opinion. I don't want an opinion. It is written. According to the Bible, it says this. Just say that. Don't even get into opinion. Okay? The word of God is our standard. Now, we had a series a couple of years ago called It Is Written. You can go back on our website, cornerstonecheshire.com, and you can look it up. We had a series, How You Can Trust the Bible. Let me just flat out tell you, the Bible is absolutely positively amazing. What you hold in your hand is the very word of God. It is the word of God. It's been tried. It's been true. The longer I'm alive, the more I read it, the more I realize it's the word of God. And I'm telling you right now, we believe that here. And so uh, my standard is not based upon what I feel at the moment. It's not based upon what the popular pastor says. It's not based upon the denomination. It's not based upon what people think and like. It's based upon the word of God. We live under a different jurisdiction. We are aliens living in this land. We're pilgrims. And yeah, 
yes, I, I abide by the laws of the land, but I must obey God rather than man. My standards and our standards should be the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of this earth. All right, so we make that very, very clear. So what do we do about all this? What happens when you make a mistake? What, okay, well, let's move on. The word of God is our standard. And Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here again because this is so important, everybody. We don't, we don't even get into debate. We go to the word of God. Do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. I'm reviewing because this is so important. For surely I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away. Have heaven and earth passed away yet? Thank you. Not one jot or one tittle, that is little punctuations on the Greek, uh, on the Hebrew, will by no means pass from the law till it's fulfilled. All right? Then, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So that's very clear what Jesus has to say. And 2 Timothy, this is the Apostle Paul, about 25 years after Jesus rose again from the dead. Now he's talking about Scripture. And by the way, the scripture he's talking about here is not the complete New Testament yet. It hasn't been written. It's being written as he's... Actually, Peter refers to Paul's writings as scripture. But look what the apostle Paul says. All scripture, what does that mean? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Righteousness simply means doing things the right way. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every Good work, all right? So this is what we believe the word of God. Now, what Jesus was doing six times in the Sermon on the Mount here, he says, you have heard it said. You've heard that it was said. Thou shalt not murder. But I say, if you're angry with your brother, you've heard it said. You heard it said not to commit adultery. I say, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So what he would do is he would say what was said, what was known, and what the Jewish people knew in that day. There were over 611 different laws uh, added on. There's so many more I could say about it. But they had all these laws that rabbinic tradition would begin to happen and what the culture of the church of the day said. And, and by the way, it was very male-dominated. And a lot of the loopholes, they found loopholes to get out of stuff. All right, they were, I mean, they could, they could cook the Bible like no one's business. And by the way, we can do the same thing if we're not careful. You have heard it said, but I say. So here we go again. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. This is what it would say in the Old Testament. That's what it said in Leviticus. It said he gave her a certificate of, of divorce for her being unclean. And the different uh, rabbinic traditions would interpret it differently. You had, quote unquote, I hate to call it this way, but you'd have the people that were more liberal or progressives or whatever you want to call them. They basically got to the point where it got, it got so bad that if your wife burns the dinner, you have grounds for divorce. <laughs> it's a good thing that Sandra has not had those grounds because I burn a lot of stuff. Okay, that was one. It got to the point where if you found someone more pretty than your wife, she was unclean, and you could get rid of her. That's, that, that, that's how bad it got. So the women, basically, they're like, they were chattel. It just didn't make a difference. And the, the damage that would do to women was extraordinarily horrible. So then you had the conservative, the real conservative ones, and they basically said this, no, 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 you cannot divorce except for adultery. So they held on to that. So what does Jesus say? Jesus says, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And Moses, by the way, did allow that. We'll get to that in a few moments. But I say to you, the completion of scripture, that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman whose divorce commits adultery. Oh, great, thank you. Over half the church now is committing adultery. <laughs> right, let's be honest. Probably, I don't know the statistics in this church, I don't have it down, but probably half the people here are, are, are divorced and are, oh, okay, great. So we're all in adulterous relationships. Should we leave our spouse and go back to the first one? No. What is that all about? We'll get to it towards the end because I want to hold you in suspense. There is a reason for what God wants to do with this. It is a, there's a way, okay? I want, but I want you to understand God's way. God's way is for restoration. I hope you understand that, all right? So, except for sexual immorality. 
And the word immorality there in the Greek is pornea, which is we get the word pornography. It can mean any sexual kind of stuff. So now, now I know people have taken that. Well, my husband looked at a TikTok. It's pornographic. I'm divorcing him or whatever. Don't look for loopholes. Look for loopholes to save your marriage, not to get out of it. It's going to say that. Except for sexual morality causes her to commit adultery. We've read that already. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Okay? So God is about saving us. Do we understand that? Thank you so much. The world, word of God is our standard, not opinion, not what some pastor says. I don't care what pastor says. I don't even care what I say. What does the word of God say? The Bible says they checked what the Apostle Paul said. The Bereans were more noble than the other ones. When the Apostle Paul spoke, they checked the Scripture. You should be checking the Scriptures, by the way, what I'm saying to make sure I'm right. God created marriage. Okay, God made marriage. Not the Supreme Court. Not an institution. God created marriage. So I want to make that abundantly clear, Okay. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him. This is another passage of Scripture where he deals with the same topic. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? For burning the dinner? Because someone's better looking? Or the conservative? Which one is it? He's asking. What does Jesus say? He answered and said to them, Have you not read? What did Jesus say? Well, I think based upon what I've noticed in society. You know, we've evolved as a society. We've grown from there. And so God is an evolving God. And what was true back then, you know, they used to murder people by stoning them, and we don't do that anymore, and we've evolved to that. So therefore, we don't listen to the scriptures about that anymore. And so that was back then. They, they were misogynists, and they were homophobic and all that. But today, we're better than that, and we know better, and we've evolved as a culture, and God's about love and peace. Therefore, this is what I have to say. What, is that what Jesus said? No, what do you say? Have you not read? What was Jesus' first response to temptation in the wilderness? It is written. What should be our response when we're asked by the enemy? It is, written. it is written. What does the word of God say, right? That he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. Now, I recognize, listen, everybody, I recognize this is countercultural. I understand that. But listen, the United States is about 240 some odd years old. It's not going to be around forever. But the word of God is going to be around forever. I stand on the word of God, and we need to be standing on the word of God. Not angry. Oh, that's right. Marriage is between a man and a woman. No. I mean, that's not, that's not what we're trying to be doing. If you act that way, that's not going to really solve anything, except show that you're kind of a, a church, I'm, I'm not going to say it, a turkey. Okay? No. Remember how much you've been forgiven. Remember, remember how much you've been saved. And remember, for those who don't know Jesus, what do you expect? Okay? So, have you not read that who made them in the beginning made them male and female? God made, God made something. God made marriage. Therefore, God defines marriage, not humanity. Legal contracts, I understand that. Acquisition of property and, and, and all that, I, I get that. And that's important as well. But, listen, but I'm talking about that beyond what the laws of the land say. He said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. I need to hear, this is for the Italian moms out there. <laughs> he should have put that in the scripture. And for all your tie-ins out there, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined, actually be glued to or cemented to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And they become one flesh. That's what we believe. There's more we can say about it, but God created marriage for, for this, the foundation of society. He created a helpmeet. He created for to work together. There's no suitable helper for Adam. He made Eve out of his side. Okay? And they worked together. And they eventually procreated. They made more life. Be fruitful, the Bible says, and multiply and subdue and take care of things. That's what God made. That's what God made. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. That's what the Word of God says. The two shall become one flesh. So then, they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. The King James said asunder. I had no idea what asunder was. I thought that was something you hear in enlightenment and it rains. No, that's not sunder. Let no man divorce or separate what God's put in place. Yeah, but I, 
I, I found my soulmate now. I don't have my soulmate. Now I found my soulmate. Well, if you went before God and you married someone, you made a commitment, you should keep that commitment. But I don't like her anymore. Okay, that's, okay we'll get into that next week. I'll let Pastor Rich deal with that. Yeah. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate? First of all, Moses never commanded to give a certificate. He permitted a certificate, not commanded. And God never commanded anyone in Scripture to divorce anybody. Infidelity and cheating on a spouse, I believe it's God's plan and purpose to bring restoration. But you have a right if you don't want to, according to the Scriptures. Okay, let's move forward here. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give it a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the what? Hardness of your hearts permitted, didn't command, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. We need to go back to God's design. Polygamy was also very big back in those days. It was. Yeah, why was that? Well, that's a good question. First of all, there's not one scripture in the Bible that has anything good to say about polygamy. Every time a polygamous thing happened, including with Abraham, it ended in, it ended in disaster, jealousy, death, loss of life. Never was God's. God permitted it. Yeah, he did to a certain extent. Doesn't mean he condoned it. You see, when you and I first gave your life to Christ, when a baby is born, a baby does not know how to balance his checkbook yet. Some of you will never know how to balance your checkbook because you don't use checkbooks. But you know what I'm saying. You, you don't know how to make your bed. You don't even know how to go to the bathroom. All you have is a diaper. But you grow. God takes you where you are to bring you where you should be. And so God was patient with society back then. They had blind spots. Oh, I don't know if you recognize this, but we had blind spots too. We used to allow slavery in America. And that was common. Well, everyone else is doing it. It's okay. But is that God's plan? No. So... He permitted you to divorce your wives, but it was not that way from the beginning. It was not so. We must go back to God's design. If you violate God's design, you get violated by the design. If you violate God's design, God's design will viol violate you without him even being there. If I don't change the oil in my car and I put, and I, and I put sugar in my gas tank, What's going to happen is the laws of that engine are going to violate me. So you go against God's design. And so what, what do we see going on in our culture today, everybody? No fault, divorce, and what you see what's going on. Mental illness is through the roof. The neurologists are telling us the first five years of a child's life is extremely important. Patterns are set up for the rest of his life. You have all this turmoil in the house. What that does to the child? I mean, I can go on and on about this and, and make you feel hopeless, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to give you hope and rest, restitution, and resolution. So he permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, he makes it clear, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality or pornea, and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her is divorced and commits adultery. Great, so what are we supposed to do then? Am I supposed to leave my spouse and go back to the first one? No, thank you. Is that what I'm supposed to do? No. What did Jesus do with the women caught in adultery? What did he say? Okay, I don't condemn you. Go and what? Sin no more. If you've crashed and burned a couple of marriages and you're in a new one, what Jesus would say to you is, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Take ownership of what happened. Deal with the pain. Maybe get prayer. Maybe get counseling. Deal with all the junk that's inside of you. And now you're in a new marriage. It's not the unpardonable sin. However, if this, well, gee, you know what? I don't like my wife very much. I'm gonna go ahead and get divorced and he'll forgive me after. Listen, I'm not God. I don't wanna play with God that way, do you? Absolutely not, okay? So if you can reconcile, by all means, reconcile. If you're in an abusive relationship and you're being abused physically or mentally, I understand that. God does not call you to be abused. And it could be, some would interpret based upon 1 Corinthians 7, 
that, that, that the spouse has abandoned you because they're beating you up or whatever they're doing. And again, this is more complicated, more nuanced, and we're not gonna be able to solve it here today. But I encourage you, if you struggle with this, feel free, feel free to call the office, make it a point. We'll help you and help give you biblical counsel the best way we can because we understand circumstances are different. But don't look for a loophole. Look for a loophole to save your marriage, not to lose your marriage. It hurts society. It hurts everything. Make no mistake about it. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. <laughs> We're going to hear it. Oh, no. That's true. Take marriage seriously. I don't care what the political candidates do. I don't care what pastors do. It's wrong. Divorce hurts people. God hates divorce because God hates to see people hurt. Okay? He's not against you being happy. He's against you being hurt ultimately. You might think you're happy taking a shortcut, but that shortcut will turn into a long cut and will cut generations of people. It's best to get it right. My parents, which will be here in the next service, almost got a divorce. Almost got a divorce. And let me just tell you something. They had this uh, quiet thing going on. They never yelled. They never said anything insulting to each other. But me as the youngest one, I picked up on it. I was a great student, and I started getting in fights in school. I started beating people up. I know, it's, it's obvious I'm so strong. <laughs> I started punching people and causing all kinds of trouble. I was a, I was a wreck. I really was. Meanwhile, I, there was never argument, but I, I sensed something was wrong in the house. I had nightmares at night. I had night terrors going on during this time. I think it was a demonic attack upon my family. And by God's grace... God saved their marriage. They were ready to walk. I mean, my dad was clueless, like a lot of men. He was clueless. I can say that because I'm a man. If I offended you, get over it. But what happened was this. You know what changed my, uh, my parents' marriage? Somebody in the body of Christ said, what you're doing is wrong. The Bible says. Not I think or they think the Bible says. And the word of God touched my parents' hearts, and they made a decision to go after healing. And now they're married 64 years, whatever it is, and they love each other like nothing, no one's business. Well, actually, it is your business, I'm talking about it. <laughs> but they got a great marriage, but they almost lost it. But why do they stop? Because of the what? Word of God. Now, what would have happened if they would have gotten divorced? I don't know if I'd be here right now. I don't know what my family would be like. Think about it. Everything would be because they stayed together, because they worked it out. I'm here today. And I'm passing on a legacy of strong marriages. And I told my wife, amen. Amen. I told my wife that if she leaves me, I'm coming along. <laughs> I have just... The only way you're going to get rid of me, honey, is in a pine box. That's it. I'm not going to be cremated. I don't believe in that. But that's beside the point. I, I, I'm not going to, by the way, that's a little joke. Don't, don't be defended when I said that too. Okay. But his disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it better not to be married. Listen, if you're with someone you don't want to marry, get out of the situation. Don't be living with each other. It's not good for you. Do you know statistics, even by non-Christians, -people, non people that live together before marriage have a higher rate of divorce than those that wait? Guys, do it God's way. God understands what he's doing. He loves you and he wants, desires to you to have a good life. So say, God is about saving us. I hope you understand that. The word of God is our standard, not public opinion, not opinion polls. I don't care what the Zogby poll says. I don't care what Gallup says. I don't care what pastor such and such says. I don't even care what I say, okay? God created marriage. Divorce is not God's plan. I mean, it's a very simple outline, is it not? Okay, furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Here's Jesus as we close out. But I say to you, as the worship team makes their way up, that, that's not part of the verse. I just put that there. <laughs> I don't know how Jesus could even conduct ministry without a keyboard. <laughs> just don't know how he did it. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery and whoever marries a woman is, uh, or, excuse me, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Okay, I think we shared about it already.
But for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband, the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to conclude with this. If you are abandoned, if you're married to an unbeliever, and he leaves or she leaves, the Bible says, it, again, this is a little more complicated, a little more nuanced. There is, but Jesus says there's no other way except for, um, except for adultery. The Apostle Paul expands that a little bit, keeping within the same confines of Scripture, and talks about abandonment. And people say, what's abandonment? Again, if you're using loopholes to get out of it, how are you abandoned? I feel so alone. I'm so alone. I'm abandoned. Therefore, I can leave. No, no. It's the very last resort. And the Bible never commands anyone to get a divorce. I believe some of you need to heal your marriage. I believe some of you need to cancel. I don't care if you spent $5,000 at the lawyer's office. You need to cancel it and make it right. Make it right. For the sake of your children, for the sake of society, for the sake of being obedient to God. You know what makes life worth living? Besides Jesus Christ, commitments. We live in a non-committed place. If I, don't like the, if I don't like the way John sang this past week, then I'm going to another church. If I don't like the way, I don't like that point he gave, I'm going to a different church. And we just move around. Every five years, every three years, someone moves around. You know what that creates? When you don't make commitments, it creates instability and it creates mental health problems. This is, I'm not making this stuff up. Neurologists will show you what the Bible's been talking about for thousands of years. You know what makes life worth living? Commitments. Even Carl Jung talked about that, the psychologist. Okay, commitments make life worth living. When you make a commitment to each other, you say, no matter what happens, I'm here for you. I want to encourage you with that. So, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what do we want to do? If you've made a mistake, you've been through a couple divorces, you're living with your girlfriend right now, may I please tell you, don't be living with your girlfriend or boyfriend. It's not God's plan. It's going to hurt you. It's going to cheapen your relationship. I'm just going to tell you like it is. That's what the Word of God says, not my opinion. Okay, if we confess our sins, He's faithful to forgive. Now, you got to confess your sins. You have to, you have to take ownership. If I, if, if I go to Malcolm over there and I take Malcolm's cell phone from him, and I, hey, John, this is for you, John. This is for you, my gift to you. Did I really give... John, a gift of my cell phone? No. I gave him Malcolm's. Mal Malcolm, thank you for that. But if I give him my cell phone, I own it. I have the right to give it to John. Until you own your sin, you can't get rid of it. You need to own it and say, I have sinned. I've done wrong. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, check this out. If we say we have not sinned, ah, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a propensity. No. If we confess, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So what we want to do is get right before God. You need to ask God to forgive you. And may I encourage you, I'm a strong believer in this, in the United States of America, we have this idea, I have a personal Jesus. In other words, it's me and Jesus enclosed, encapsulated. I'm a Christian. I go to whatever church I feel like going for that day. Some days I'm going to listen to the guy on, on YouTube. Other days I'm going to go to the other church. I like to worship. Sometimes I like going to the other church. But I am my own. I, I, you know, I'm a Christian. And maybe that's where you're at. But you know, that's not biblical. Jesus didn't die for the individual, though he did. He died for the church, plural, ecclesia, ones called out of. You see, so if you're not, I'm not saying you have to commit to a cornerstone. Commit to a Bible-believing church, if not this one. But you know what the Bible says in the book of James? I, I bring it up all the time. It says, it says this, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. God forgives sins. The body heals it. Do you realize there are people in this room that have been married many, many years that could help you in your marriage?
Do you realize there are people that have started businesses in this room that could help you start your business? Do you realize there's people that have faced depression and anxiety issues and they've gotten free and they could help you through it? Do you realize that body, it takes the body to heal the body. God forgives us of what the body heals. And so if you have a lousy marriage, there are people here that want to help you. There's a way out, but it takes the body. Now, I'm not substituting Jesus the head, but the reason he's called, we're called the body is because we're connected to the head. Uh, do you understand what I'm trying to say? We're not a headless body. If we are, that's sick. <laughs> okay? We are a body connected to the head and to each other. The only way you and I are truly going to grow up in Christ is to be committed to Jesus and committed to each other and commit yourself to be discipled and grow together. Become more like Jesus together. That's what he's calling us to do. We want to help you with that. I want to help you with that. That's what it's all about. So, if you're struggling in your marriage, and you if, feel free to call us this week, and we'll, we'll do our best to help you with that, and maybe get you paired up with someone that can help you. Listen, we want to live a life that God would have us live. Amen? We want to live in healing. So, I'm going to ask you one moment to bow your heads for a moment. And maybe your marriage is, is maybe you're just tolerating your marriage. Maybe, you know, you know you're not supposed to get a divorce, but I'm done with her. She's done with me. We're going to sleep in separate bedrooms. We're going to stay together for the kids or the grandkids. We're going to stay together for the, uh, for the, uh, the money that we have in the bank, but I'm done with him. Or maybe you are in the process right now of getting a divorce, or maybe you're living with somebody. Just take a moment right now. Let's just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, we've been shown once again what your word says. And God, I thank you. You sent your word to heal our dis-ease. And Father, all of us here today have dis-ease in our life of one sort or another. Father, we choose to obey your word above our thoughts, our feelings, the cultural norms. We choose to stand on your word, which is forever. Lord, I commit myself to follow your word. We pray. Father, I just pray right now for healing on marriages in Jesus' name. I pray for those that are living together, they would know there's a better way. Father, that you love them so much and you want to see them do well. And Father, this is a way that seems right unto a man but ends in death. And Father, you have come to give us life. You've come to give us abundant life. And your ways are always better. And your ways are eternal. And so Father, I pray for reorganization. I pray, Lord God, that people would cancel their divorces. That people would seek to reconcile for the sake of your kingdom and all the ramifications of their family and everything else connected to it. Father, I thank you. You're the God that raises the dead and you can raise a dead marriage. And I pray that you would do that today in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I do this every week. Are you absolutely positive that if you were to die today, you'd be with Jesus in heaven? If your answer is, well, compared to everybody else, it doesn't cut it. There's only one way God will accept you. It's by accepting Jesus as your Lord. That means he's in charge and you're not. And he's your savior. He's forgiven your sins. Otherwise, there's no salvation in any other name. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you still walk with God and you're not walking with him anymore. You're not quite sure where you're at. I'm gonna say a prayer in a few moments. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand, not for my ego, but to join you in prayer. How many of you would say today, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time or I've fallen away and I want to get right. Just real quick. Put your hand up real quick. Anyone this morning? Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Anyone online? Okay, let's just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, in your heart, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And today, I choose to step down and being in charge of my life. I give my life to you now in Jesus' name. Come enter my life. Amen. If you pray that prayer, we believe you became born again. But Jesus says to us, he didn't say, say a prayer, goodbye. He says, come, follow me. We are a community of people that are following Christ. I want to encourage you on your card. There's a place for you to put down here. I made a commitment. As you walk out of here today, there are boxes in the back. We can put it along with your offering, okay? 
we're gonna go ahead and do that. We'll help you with the next steps. There's also a bunch of ways you can give. You can see it on the screen. If you wanna follow Jesus, 860-499-4888. That's not Jesus' phone number, by the way, but that's how we can. Okay, and uh, if you wanna go ahead and give, you can use your, if you know how to do that, the QR code. And uh, four different ways you can give. Click Cornerstone Cheshire, text Cornerstone, download the app, and also there are boxes in the back. Amen? Can we all stand? Hey, listen, we're going to have a prayer team come down at the end of their service today. We've seen people get healed up here. Uh, we have a team that loves to pray for people, and they're up front. They have name tags on. They'll be facing you. And so as we leave here today, we're going to ask you if you could leave and let people be prayed for. You can go ahead and have fellowship outside. We want to leave an opportunity for people, okay? But let me just go ahead and say a benediction over you. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. May he fill you with his peace. May the love of the Father give you solidarity and comfort. May the Spirit give you the ability to go in strength and power. And may the love of Jesus give you access to know that you are a child of God. May the Lord bless you. Amen and amen. amen.